Okay, let me just look at, yeah, I think everything is, is working. And let me pull up uh, John and, I wrote John and Sam instead of John and Theo. It's because they told me Sam and Theo were gonna talk and then Sam didn't come, it's John and Theo. Um, so let me introduce uh, John and uh, Theo. So uh, we've, uh, we've been doing this uh, Dragonfly software for a few years now. And back, uh, anybody here a uh, participant in the Tosca conferences that happen sometimes in North America, sometimes in Europe? All right. So um, uh, in uh, Tosca in, in the swamp in Gainesville, Florida, back in uh, uh, 2018 or 2019, was the first time that we tried a Dragonfly hands-on workshop using Amazon Cloud. And to great success, I got to all these people who had never touched deep learning to sit down in a in a, in a computer lab and in one afternoon succeed in some deep learning. And one of the people among them was John Corbin, who um, uh, I think he was both, had a Sandia appointment and had a, a graduate student position at the time. Uh, and he, uh, he came away seeing what Dragonfly could do and took it back to Sandia. And now, uh, now they're using it in all sorts of great ways. So it was my pleasure to get to uh, meet Sam and, and uh, connect with him then. So uh, go ahead and come on up, uh, Sam and Theo. Did I? Um, Close. Members of the technical staff at Sandia National Lab. And uh, they're going to talk to us about, they're, they're, they're really pushing uh, outside the box. So they said, we're not going to wait for Dragonfly team to figure out what we want to do. We're going to program Dragonfly to do what we do and to batch process it and use the flexibility. So I'll bet. No one else in this audience has, has written any Dragonfly Python code. So lay it on them. Tell them what they can do with it, all right? Um, yeah, let's welcome Theo and John. Thank you. So before we get started, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about Sandia National Lab. So we're the nation's engineering lab. Uh, there's Lawrence Livermore, uh, Los Alamos, and us. Uh, responsible for weapons work. So because of that, we can't show you a lot of cool stuff that we're doing. So our examples are gonna be very generic, but it works on much cooler things than what we're going to show you, I promise. Um, so a little bit about who we are and where we come from. Uh, we're part of the Thunder CT Lab. So we have a, been given a unique role. Uh, our customers trust us to figure out cool things, so we are given the chance and opportunity to play around with what's possible. And so we get to do lots of crazy scans of animals, like we scan Klein bottles because it's fun to look at their thickness and all sorts of various things. But in that, it gives us the opportunity to grow what is possible and sort of push on the boundaries. And we're given permission to fail, which is a unique thing out in industry. Um, but what we mainly focus on, why they pay us, is looking at explosive tools. So what is that in general? Um, if you think in RPG and the movies, right, the classic cone-shaped thing, somebody shooting at a tank, that's an explosive. It does something useful. So we're given the challenge of take those things that you can't test otherwise, because if you test them, they're gone, um, turn those into or digitize them, so that you can see inside, see all the defects, find all those defects, figure out whether they matter or not, and then use that to uh, perform evaluations on whether they meet their, uh, I guess, performance criteria. And then once we have that decision, either put them out in the field or burn them and make them go away. So it's really high consequence, and because it's difficult to do this. We turned to Dragonfly because it was the only way to really script this and have a process that scales. Scale is critical to us because we get asked to do a lot of these. So this is just an example of one tool that we get asked to look at here. And each week, right, we sometimes have lulls where we're doing 10 a week. But there are weeks where we're asked to do hundreds of these evaluations a week. And so it's a big scalable problem. And well, I guess because of where we come from, we're used to thinking about things like high performance computing, where you're going to have uh, queuing systems, you're gonna have workflows so that you can basically make the AI or computer handle all of your problems for you. Um, why is it also important for us to automate things? Because this is what we're having to deal with. 
So uh, we've seen a lot of people doing segmentation, doing analysis. We're trying to do it at scale repeatedly and where every decision that we make has life altering consequences for people. So every step has to be perfect, um, which makes it, I guess, very difficult compared to what it should be. Um, but what you get out of this complexity is the ability to address a lot of problems all at once and uh, I guess turn around answers really quickly as long as you have an infrastructure that is set up to handle this. And I apologize for it being an eye chart. You can go back and look and see all the various steps. Um, one of the cool things that comes out of having such complexity is that you're able to look at customers differently. So we think about everybody involved with the uh, digitization process as a customer. We have CT technologists who are running our CT machines and they need to be able to quickly tell, is the scan that they acquired useful and good? We have got people who are watching these orders for uh, analysis come through. They need to know where the each tool is in that process. So everybody has different things that they're looking for, but by automating, we can pull data out at every step and hand deliver each unique asset to the appropriate level of people. So it makes it easy to do this, but there's a lot of other stuff that you have to do in the background to make it feasible. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Theo to talk about how we're actually doing this. Okay, so I, I hope that some of the, the things that you picked up from what John was just talking about is that we're making important decisions. We're making those decisions at scale. So hundreds or thousands of items. Uh, and um, there's, there's quite a lot involved with each one of those decisions. And so um, automating as much of that process uh, as possible is really important to us. Um, here's, here's the hardware that we use to do this. Um, and I have a picture of an iPhone because in my mind, the iPhone is one of the most ubiquitous pieces of hardware. And I don't have a picture of our cluster, so you have an iPhone. Um, we have a Linux cluster, it's pitsy booted, which basically it's diskless, so it scales up. If we buy more computers, we plug them into the network and turn them on and they come up with the full environment that we've made. Uh, each one of our nodes uh, has like an RTX 6000 GPU. We've got a half terabyte of RAM um, and a bunch of, uh, bunch of x86 cores. Fun fact, our, uh, some of the original nodes in our cluster, we actually borrowed from the supercomputer at Sandia that was being retired at the time. And we're like, we need resources. Can you, instead of throwing those away, can we have them? And uh, we upgraded the, the components in them and put them to use. We also have several petabytes of storage. Uh, the other really funny thing is we're out in the middle of nowhere. So you go out into this little tin shed and there's petabytes of file systems just churning away at things. So it's a eclectic environment. And the other thing that we'll mention is that None of these computers have screens. And so we've seen awesome work that you guys have been doing in the Dragonfly GUI. All of this is happening um, from Python level up, uh, importing Dragonfly's Python environment uh, and just running a Python script. Um, so that's kind of, kind of a unique flavor of, of a way of doing things in Dragonfly. So we go back to that, that previous map of steps or things that are involved with doing uh, these inspections. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll highlight in blue the things that we are using Dragonfly for. Um, and we are going to talk over a couple specific um, kind of uh, a couple specific workflows and share with you the high level steps so that if you were interested in uh, having an environment or doing these types of things for yourselves, here's what you would here's the steps that you would take to do that. Uh, so we're going to go over uh, generating media, and you'll see why this is important to us in a minute. Um, uh, we're going to talk about uh, global GDNT, um, and then also how you could compare an ideal version of your object to each individual as-built object. Uh, there was some really cool discussion about Atlas models uh, this morning uh, that is kind of related to that. Uh, if you guys were in the talk with Eric Yen, uh, we talked some about Dragonfly's data organizer and ways of organizing and quickly searching uh, through all of the things that you have previously scanned. This is just how we're doing it. We have an internal confluence page, which is like a Wikipedia, and every scan that comes off of the machine, uh, we look for certain metadata files. 
we allocate a node on that cluster and that node will open up Dragonfly or run Python code to basically spit out 8-bit images because our machine's operating at 16-bit. Um, so some of these are like clay heat, like real aggressive uh, clay heat filters, basically an edge detector so you can see anomalies in your data. And then there's also like a video that rotates through all the different slices of your data so that uh, you can quickly visualize it. And this is not how you would do any sort of like real intensive, I want to go look at a feature in my data set, but it helps you, um, it helps the team coordinate and to know what things we have scanned when we have an order of a thousand things, how many of them have we scanned, what was the last one that scanned. It's also helpful for debugging things like uh, maybe we're losing pixels on the detector or something's going wrong with the machine and the scans are not coming out to the quality that we need. Um, so that is how we are organizing our data is, or searching our data is we have a, a web page um, where each each thing on that web page is a scan and we can go look at a quick picture of it. That's in its end to its own. Something else we might want to talk about is uh, how we are using Dragonfly um, to kind of quickly generate very rough segmentations of things. Um, basically, what we are doing is uh, we've mentioned we've heard uh, local Otsu mentioned a couple of times here. Um, we're doing recursive Otsu splits on a scan, and you can think of that as picking out the different phases of, uh, of materials that you have in a scan, um, and doing so intelligently, or doing so provides a kind of pseudo-intelligent way of labeling different materials in your scan quickly. So if I could add something, uh, we aren't just doing local Otsu. So this would be if you just did Otsu, right? You're spreading out your histogram in some more mm -hmm. useful manner. Oh, yeah. So we aren't just doing local Otsu. This is a this would be a two directional transform, right? You can go from the histogram to the sloth and back. There are other space splitting operations you can do, mm -hmm. um, connected components and things like that. And if you're clever with how you do that, they're replicatable, reproducible, mm -hmm. and they give you it's no longer interpretable as a um, histogram splitting but it gives you more meaningful information about it in a reproducible manner. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a little bit of coolness here that allows you to get to rough segmentation quickly, yeah. um, which is important for the next steps. Yeah, uh, like John was saying, reproducible from one instance to another. Like sometimes your CT machine, like the, the absolute pixel value of this material will shift up and down as you go throughout the days and weeks. This lets you, um, have a relatively stable way of identifying materials in your scans. So once you have uh, those, those identifiable materials, imagine Otsu is a binary operation. So you did a binary search tree of all the things that are, uh, all the materials and components in your scan. Then if you have a CAD, and this is a pen, like John mentioned, we can't show you actual cool things. So we're showing you boring generic things. This is a pen that we have a CAD description of. Um, you can take and match up uh, parts of your scan to different leafs on that binary search tree. And then that allows you to label voxels under each uh, like CAD component. And uh, you can um, compare how your CAD is, or how, how your part is actually built. Do you, did I miss anything on that? Uh, so this is uh, more about the rough alignment. So mm -hmm. because you have that rough segmentation, this is, I guess, one of the magical things we found is you don't want to get to a perfect segmentation right away unless you really have a lot of data tra to train off of because our things are never reproducible, really. If we can get to an ugly segmentation, we can overlay CAD on that in a reproducible manner and then do really great segmentations with that extra bit of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the secret sauce that makes that work. And like the rough alignment just gets all the CAD components in the neighborhood of where they should be. Mm -hmm. Then it's the fine alignment step that we've got that really snaps everything together. And that's using synthetic CTs that we're generating around a neighborhood to then do volume to volume matching mm -hmm. from the synthetic to the, the, I guess, real CT data. And that gets you really nice alignment of your parts. And now your CAD, every component is aligned from 
the as designed mm -hmm. to really where it is in the as built space. Yeah, thank you. And and that fine alignment is a basically an image registration of what you expected the material be to be under that CAD component versus what you actually observed. Um, and then that lets you do kind of interesting things like we can see that one of those screws is backed out slightly. Um, and because you displaced every CAD component onto your actual scan, um, you have a, a, like a simple vector that describes how your as-built part shifted with respect to your designed part. Um, and then the last thing, well, actually there's one more thing after this. Um, the other thing that you get when you do this is uh, you know the median uh, kind of expected material under each location. Um, and you can make an image of where you saw certain materials in your synthetic scan or your synthetic data that you didn't see in your real scan. Um, and this is useful for seeing where things are missing from your CAD that were not in your, or things missing in the CAD that were in your scan. So for instance, we scanned that pen and the clip was not included in the CAD description of the pen, but showed up. And so um, the, the red tells you that you need to go back and add that part into your CAD. Um, so if you assemble a whole thing and then you're missing pieces, they stand out uh, in, this, in this domain. John, I'm gonna let you talk about ModSim. Ah, so then the final bit that we're doing, so once you've got all these things nice and roughly aligned, then fine alignment on them, now you can do your actual ML segmentation and get something that's really high quality. And because of the way Dragonfly is set up, we can just take out the DICOM with each material and directly drop that into our code or take the mesh out and drop that into a finite element. And this is just a, a bat skull getting hit by like a five kilometer per second BB. So it just gets wiped away. Um, but it's, these are almost trivial because of all the steps that you've done or that you can do before this with pre-processing and getting your labeling correctly. Um, there's some other stuff that we're doing here in, uh, still a little bit working on is how to use Dragonfly to keep track of all these things under the hood and make sure that our runs are going along on the HPC systems. Um, I think with that, so yeah, Dragonfly has become really integral to what we're doing and wish we could show you some of the actual things that we can do with it. Um, but the ability to get under the hood with Python and just control everything and use the suite of tools that there is really critical to solving problems at these scales. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, so before we go to questions, I'll, I'll add on. I, I got to uh, visit these guys about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I don't remember. And and I got to see things with my uh, uh, US citizen eyes that they couldn't show here today. Um, and so there, there's a, there's a lot that they can't show and there's a lot to take away from this, but um, what uh, what they described at the very beginning is that they are really using Dragonfly in a different way rather than you doing interactive Dragonfly on the desktop. They're using Dragonfly the way a MATLAB developer might use MATLAB, and that is they're writing code and writing routines that they have complete control over that follow algorithmic consequences, but they're able to leverage all of the Dragonfly data structures. Something they didn't mention to you today, I'm gonna, uh, I wanna plug some of the things that they talked about, is they can write these fully automated solutions that follow their algorithms, and then it does all the analysis and then writes it to an ORS session. And that means they've done it all in a batch processed automated headless node, but then at the end of the day, if anybody wants to inspect it, anyone can open up an interactive Dragonfly session, load it, load the full session file and see everything. And so it's a way of having both interactive work and then having human review later. Yeah, I guess to tie onto that, having the ability to document all the steps that we're doing blind and then have it be a human interpretable is priceless. And, and then the other thing I'll say that I, I got me really excited about this is, um, what these guys are showing here with the flexibility of their, uh, they say GD&T, 
and what are we going to call that geometric uh, dis dimensioning. dimensioning and tolerance. Um, what they're doing is a lot of people can have a CAD tool and a, a, a CAD design and as scanned and tell the, the differences. But he, the, the problem is what if, uh, you know, the part is, is narrowed a little bit and that means all these parts are a little bit out of place and these parts, and so the whole thing looks like it's off. What these guys have, have uh, done uh, quite uh, impressively is every screw and every bolt is locally fit and then they make a fake perfect image and then tell you how the uh, observed image deviates from the fake perfect image. So you see the defects in the individual parts and you see the vector displacement from the global. I don't know if that came across to everyone, but I, th I thought it was really awesome when I saw it. Um, so now that I have added on to your talk, thank you for your patience, because <laughs> um, it's really exciting work. I just wanna make sure everyone gets it. Um, do we have, uh, we have questions uh, from inside the group, of, uh, from inside the room on, uh, for, for John and Theo? Uh, all right, we'll start right here. Yeah, are all the skeletons you guys scanned prepared, or do you have any skeletons You asked if all the skeletons are prepared? All the skeletons they've scanned have been prepared, or if any of them have been uh, lodged in the patient's market. Oh, so you want to know what the sample prep is for their biological specimens before they went into the CT scanner? Oh, gosh, most of these were in alcohol, and then we just took them out and we do a little bit of posing because otherwise they end up looking <laughs> like dead rats. Um, and we've done some stuff for paleontology that's in matrix. And then there was another question right here. So the question is, uh, in cases where you don't have a CAD model like a biological system, but you do have constraints um, that say the parts won't be, you know, bones won't bend 180 degrees or, or such, uh, can, you, can you think of a way to extrapolate this to something less constrained than CAD model, but still, still constrained where you want to find and piece the individual parts? That's most of what the question was, I think. Yeah, I think this would scale to that. Um, the space splitting operation, I guess, for us, we know where everything's going to be. But if you knew relationships, that's one of the things that we've been working on and aren't quite done with, but building, I guess, the, the graph networks of how they're associated and then going, yeah, the, the knee bones connected here and making that map. Yeah, there might be some interesting things that the anatomy and the factory inspection people can tell each other. Uh, if anyone has used uh, the uh, the Perkin Elmer bone analysis software, I'd like to hear about that because they're trying to do skeletal. I've never met a user, so I can't comment it, but I know they're trying to do skeletal work and assign information on whole skeletal scans using sort of the graph connectivity. Um, and there, yeah, there may be stuff to learn from these two communities. I think we had a question from Aaron. No, a question from over here somewhere. Okay, uh, uh, we'll go right here to, uh, you there? Uh, so the question is uh, uh, from someone else who's do running Dragonfly uh, in scripting mode. Uh, it's a question about uh, the openness or the the closed uh, of this particular cluster or of the, the the model of the cluster. Oh, okay. Oh, this, uh, yeah. This cluster is air gapped, so people couldn't get to it. But I think how we do or how we stand up the cluster, we're able mm -hmm. to share with people because it's yeah, it's fairly clever. He made it. If, <laughs> It's it's a Beowulf cluster, so those are those are pretty common. There's a lot of really great online guides on how to set those up, and then the only real finicky part is tying your OpenGL, um, tricking OpenGL into thinking that it has a monitor attached, um, which I can point you at some really great documentation on how to do that too. So, all right, uh, other questions from in the room? Okay. Uh, 
Jess or Ben, is either of you monitored? Do we have any questions from the remote audience? All right, well, I think we're, we'll, we'll go ahead and move on. Let's thank uh, John and Theo again.